We've been looking to leaders with little to celebrate. A shell game with interest that corporate manipulates. Some say it's honor amongst thieves and I respond to these news reports of proof when money is the motivator and network is the negotiator, it's hard not to see what's gonna happen when the mark of allegiance comes due. If deference is not to the people, what is a community supposed to do? Because debt paid is service given to the ongoing manipulation of an illusion. Representation is there for those who want a reasonable quality of life, self-determination, justice, and the truth. The manufacture of ongoing dissent pushes the country to bear witness to the stories of those most impacted. A recognition of our desire to ensure that our collective voices are heard from feet to the streets, to fingers on keys and voices on microphones, we are composing the soundtrack of transformation. Down South, the landscape is a little bit of trouble, whole lot of bass and a slight bit of reverb. There's pain in them notes. There's a legacy reflected in them lines. America's guilty conscience that white supremacy would rather ignore or deny. There's a history of resistance down here. Town hall to classroom, courtroom to the polls, an unwavering will to overcome the spirit of our ancestors in the depths of our souls. Can you feel that boom bap? Hearts pounding as we push, it's change we command. Marginalization and dismissal won't keep us from participating in the political process. Disenfranchisement is part of their plan, but a participatory democracy is what's due. Representation, access, transparency, and equity is what we demand. We sing the shift in narratives dealt with propaganda and have been fed empty rhetoric, watching media and technology being used to distort our sense of reality, talking heads who are puppets to a self-indulgent practice. These pundits are bill collectors and each appearance is payment negotiated. An installment plan spread out over cities where hate is coordinated. But we mobilize in two. Our response is motivated. By refusal to be denied, our movement won't be appropriated. We see the global ties and how our struggle is associated. With the passion in our spirit and the fire in our eyes, we set a joy, renewal, and sustainability. Welcome you present, whole, and unapologetic. Know that solidarity is necessary and how we win is organized, and we will win. We will win. So I send the I see you to all the people on the ground doing work in service to communities where you put the people first, in halls pushing policy, at meeting centering issues, where there is one, there is many because you carry your people with you. You belong to a community of fighters, a group of change makers, a powerhouse of purpose. You come from a cadre of ground shakers. Our dreams won't be dismissed. Our identities won't be disregarded. We won't stand for marginalization or subjugation. We won't watch our rights be discarded. We won't let them other us invisible. We won't keep watching state sanctioned violence with no justice. See, we know there's strength in numbers and the power we need is among us. Yes, Dasan, thank you so much. That was that was exactly what I needed right now. I hope it was exactly what y'all needed. I love what you said. You said the soundtrack of transformation. Can you feel the boom back? Can you feel the boom back? I'm gonna get y'all up in a minute. Can you feel the boom back? And I love that you said we will win. Such a perfect way to lead us into our next panel about democracy. And I wanna just say before you bounce, Dasan, uh, a little bit about you. Um, Dasan is an educator, a scholar, a cultural organizer based out of Durham, North Carolina. Well, what? I'm about to go see my, my mom in South Carolina. I'm driving starting tomorrow, so I will be in your neck of the woods. Um, and you can find out a little bit more about his work um, through his website, and that will be dropped in the chat. Thank you so much, Dasan, for, for being a brilliant poet for this particular moment. Thank you. And everybody else, I invite you to just stand up for a moment. I invite you to just stand up wherever you're at and just ground your feet and just bounce a little bit. John talked about moving from the imagined past to the belonging future when he talked today. So let's just do that. So start by swaying. We're moving from the, the imagined past, you know, make America great again, no. We're moving from that imagined past that worked for anybody and we're, belong, we're moving to the belonging future. So just stretch side to side, side to side, bridging, bridging. John talked a lot about bridging. So we're bridging between the places where we feel 
that we don't belong to the places that we do. And we're bringing everybody with us. And then take a breath. And let it out. And again, breathe in. And this time, stretch your arms on the breath out. And then just shake. Shake it all out. Let the blood come up, back up to your brain because you've been sitting down, you've been thinking, you've been talking. You've got to let your body do some work too. And then join me again at the screen. All right, thank you to those who did that or who were able to. And if you weren't able to stand, maybe you shook around a little bit, and that's awesome. So now let's move into our panel. It's called Democracy, Institutions, and Systems of Othering and Belonging. And bring your body with you in this conversation. And right now I'd like to bring on Mirna Perez, who will be facilitating the conversation. Mirna is joining us from the Brennan Center for Justice in New York City, where she works on core issues related to expanding democracy and voting rights. Welcome, Mirna. Thank you so much for having me. Bienvenidos, welcome. I'm Mirna Perez. I am the director of the Voting Rights and Elections Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. Um, I'm thrilled to be uh, with all of you today. Um, and I uh, am very excited about this panel and about the conversations that are far overdue that are going to be happening here. Um, we all know that the last year was very trying um, for so many reasons. Um, coronavirus uh, really exposed many cracks in many of our systems, including cracks in the healthcare system, uh, cracks in the criminal justice system, uh, cracks in our democratic institutions. And in addition to uh, revealing those cracks, it also compounded many of those cracks. And I think that uh, what's really going to be useful about this panel today is that we're going to be looking beyond the most dramatic flashpoints that we saw in the last year and in the last five years to be looking at the bigger picture of what is happening in our democracy and the different ways in which we are not living up to our ideals and the different ways in which we are not living up to the promises that we have given these citizens um, for equal access and equal opportunity. Um, now these threats are real, these threats are profound and these threats are systemic. And as such, it's important that we really look at what is impeding our equal access to the vote. What is impeding our ability to have a constructive civil dialogue and what is impeding our ability um, to solve our problems through uh, liberation and, and collaboration. Um, we're concluding with thoughts from our panelists about different actions we can all take um, to make sure that we have a, a renewal and a recommitment to, uh, to our principles of democracy and equality. And we're gonna be looking at the way the institutional, the infrastructural, and even the interpersonal play into all of this. So I'm gonna first get things started uh, by introducing our uh, exciting panelists, uh, Astra Taylor, is a documentary filmmaker, political organizer, and writer. Um, she's published widely in major news outlets and will soon release her follow-up to Democracy May Not Exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone, a new book called Remake the World. Dewana Thompson is the creator of Woke Vote, a program designed to engage and mobilize African-American millennial and faith-based voters, now an organization that is active in a dozen states in South and Miss West, and Teku Lee, is an expert on racial and ethnic politics, democratic practice, and public opinion. Uh, he is a George Johnson Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science at UC Berkeley. Thank you and welcome for joining us all today. Um, so just to make sure that the audience gets to meet all of y'all and gets to learn a little bit about how you think and what inspired you to be here with us today, we're gonna have a lightning round. So this is going to be a very quick response. Um, I am going to ask all of you to tell me in no fewer, uh, no more than two minutes, um, what is the most important democratic institution today for a shared we moving forward? And I'll start with you, Astra, and then I'll go to you, Dewana, and then you take. Okay, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me, everyone. Um, to be quick, I mean, I, I would say civil society organizations that have a mass membership in our, um, if they 
need funding are, are dues funded, funded and controlled, and thereby accountable to members. I think this is something that's just really important. Mass <laughs> organizations, of course, I'm thinking about labor unions, but not only really any kind of group that is rooted in a community that is enduring, that is democratic. And again, you know, the, the political economy of it is, you know, is one that supports democracy, small d democracy and is you know, that's why dues are so important. So I organized with a group called the Debt Collective, which is a union for debtors that's attempting to create a uh, space for a new identity to see our debts as a bridge. Our debts is something we all have in common um, in order to organize people and build power from the bottom up. So I'm thinking about how we need to not just, you know, mobilize people to get out the vote, but create lasting associations that, that can carry this project forward. For the long haul. Okay, thank you. Dewana Yu, what is the most important democratic institution today for a shared we moving forward? Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, I thought about this and, and two things come to mind. One, the neighborhood leadership model. So in a lot of communities, there are leaders who are, you know, elected as neighborhood presidents, neighborhood, uh, you know, uh, organizers who act on behalf of whole sectors of our community. And I think that, and, and there's, a, there's a neighborhood council nationally, all of those different organizations, those neighbors being able to have budgets that in, that they're able to um, monitor and manage on behalf of the critical immediate needs in those communities, that, that program uh, is, is essentially important in order to have neighborhood impact on local and, and uh, uh, statewide policy. And the second thing I would say is access to municipal and statewide government, right? Whether, um, and, and, and by that, I mean local individuals having a, a resources to run for those offices and reflect the ideals of the people that, of the neighborhoods that they serve. Um, local government, we all know that all, all, all government and all law is local. And so when we have more people who are able to access that from the vantage of being neighborhood presidents or people who are within their communities, you will see a more participatory, a more enlightened, um, if you will, electoral process in, in governing structure because those individuals are coming from the places that they serve. Thank you. And Teku, what is the most important democratic institution today for a shared we moving forward? Yeah, look, I mean, there's so many broken pieces in our system that there are many candidates for most important democratic institution, right? So I think top of mind answer uh, today would be probably the criminal justice system from the rampant numbers of beat cops who are inadequately trained, impulsively triggered, and probably shouldn't be in law enforcement to begin with, all the way up to a judiciary that's increasingly populated by judges handpicked for their ideological beliefs and not their legal expertise or commitments to equal justice under the law. And also top of the mind today, I think, is our electoral system, especially the laws and regulations that govern who gets to vote, whose votes get to count. Um, how parties and politicians continue to choose their voters through re redistricting rather than voters getting to choose their parties and politicians. And there's no other way to put it than that that electoral system is under assault. But, um, you know, as of the end of March, legislators had introduced 361 bills with restrictive provisions in 47 states, right? Uh, but I want to briefly surface two other, I think, less top of mind democratic institutions that I think are absolutely critical to you know, achieving our democratic potential. And I think if we can restore and remake these institutions, then reforming criminal justice uh, and our electoral system- Teku, uh, I think that might get to our next question. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have you take a, a pause right there. And then Dewana, why don't you start off with what are some of the biggest threats to those democratic institutions? And then what are some solutions that you have? Obviously, the impact of voter suppression um, and voter intimidation is a, is a huge threat uh, to, to the institutions that all of us are talking about right now, particularly being from Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm also the director of the Civil Rights Institute here. I can tell you that this is a systemic problem that is rearing its face in, the, in, in a different way, but with, that is rooted in, at the very end of the day, the, the idea that some belong and some do not. And so that theory of belonging and not belonging, we see that across the board, whether it's in the electoral space, whether it's in criminal justice, whether it's in education, whether it's in food, uh, you know, food deserts and disparity, the idea that some have and some don't and that there's no access to that is the is the, the biggest threat. And all of it really is an economic issue, right? Access to economic opportunity, access to economic um, resources in which to build these spaces that we need in order to be able to activate, um, you know, and, and really 
determine our own, um, if you will, lens around liberation and lens around how, what does it mean to be able to take care of yourself, your family, your community? Um, all of that, it, it boils down to access to be able to play in the, in, in the economic space. And we do not see that um, in an equitable way across communities. That's great. Okay, Teku, sorry for interrupting, but why don't we start now? Like the you're answering, um, what are the biggest threats to the democratic institutions that you thought were powerful and what are some things we can do about it? So I think the democratic institutions that are under the greatest threat uh, are a free press and a functioning party system. A uh, free press, I think, is, is the critical fourth estate that serves as gatekeeper, agenda setter, watchdog, without which we critically cannot know the reality of our circumstances so that we as a democratic public can act on that reality. And the role of that free press, as we've all seen, has been under unprecedented assault, especially during the Trump presidency. And a functioning presidency is also critical because the ideal of popular sovereignty and the freedom and power that implies that um, you know we the people hold um, is meaningless unless we have a real meaningful choice between competing visions for the future of the country. And that choice between parties and visions cannot be a choice between one party that has contributed to mass incarceration, mass deportation, big bank uh, bailouts, slow walking responses to climate change and economic inequality and structural racism on the one hand, and another party that cannot stand up to as a party you know, it's bully of chief, uh, bully in chief, and you know that has succumbed to a hostile takeover from an extremist white nationalist fringe. That can't be the choice of parties to sustain, you know, um, uh, our you know potential uh, as a democracy. If I had more time, I would really love to go more into the I'm biggest give you threats of, of the party system. But I think I think those are really those are really the big threats. Great, great. And Astra, why don't you close out this uh, this last lightning rod? What is the biggest yeah. threat to that institution and what can we do about it? I mean, we're in a space where we're talking big picture, right? And for me, the underlying threat to uh, all of these dimensions we brought in here and to people's capacity to organize is racial capitalism. And that phrase is used because capitalism is always racialized. It differentiates people in order to exploit people, divides and conquers. And that is, that's, you know, that leads to a concentration of wealth and power that undermines our democratic institutions, that, you know, we have no public media, our media is profit driven to go to your comments on the fourth estate. And I'm thinking a lot these days about how it undermines our ability to organize, right? I mean, so we have laws, you know, it's it's illegal to have a solidarity strike, right? I mean, you know, organizing is very constrained and it creates um, imbalances of money and power so that philanthropy can fund certain types of organizing over others. Um, so just thinking about how the legal and political terrain becomes inhospitable to our our organizing. And so what do we, how do we overcome that? We organize more, we organize better, we keep fighting. But I think that's that's the big underlying system that we're up against in my view. And that's why I focus on um, economics in my, in my activism. Okay. Well, thank you all. And I'm really glad that the audience got a little bit of a flavor of, uh, of your work and all of your your thinking and all of your uh, approach to how we tackle the many problems of, of today. Um, we're now going to go into some deeper dives. So folks that felt like they had to put this thing through quickly will have more time. I'm not going to interrupt you unless you go more than six or so minutes. Um, but uh, uh, we're going to start with Teku. And um, We've been noticing that you have been talking a lot about connections between ideological polarization, racial polarization, and what you have called in your writing to be epistemic polarization. Can you share us with us with what those connections are and help us understand how these challenges we face toward reaching some of these ideals of democracy and belonging and how they interact, please? Sure. Um, so ideological polarization is the divide between liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, which has gotten to the point in this country. And I'll just give you one data point here where, you know, 36% uh, of Republicans see Democrats as a threat to the nation's well being. Uh, that's a 2014 Pew survey. And that same survey finds that 27% of Democrats see Republicans as a threat to the nation's well being. Uh, and in that survey, 82% of Republicans have a generally unfavorable view of Democrats and 79% of Democrats have a generally unfavorable view of Republicans. And that's a survey that was conducted 
before Trump. So I would bet the House that these numbers are way higher today than they were back in 2014. And we all know intuitively that this spells trouble, but let me give you a sense of the stakes here, at least the way political scientists see it. So um, there are two um, uh, well-known political scientists, Steve Levitsky and Dan Ziblatt, um, one of whom studies transitions to democracy in Latin America. The other studies transitions to democracy in Eastern Europe. Uh, they wrote a book, sort of a red alert book in uh, 2016 titled How Democracies Die. Uh, and in their book, Levitsky and Ziblatt identified two conditions under which across the world and over spans of history, established democracies descend into authoritarian rule. And those two conditions are one, when the society's politics are polarized and factionalized, and two, when there is a loss of what uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt call norms of mutual toleration and forbearance, by which they mean competing parties no longer accept each other as legitimate rivals, and when competing parties no longer exercise restraint in using institutional prerogatives. So on the former, think about Trump and the Republicans claiming widespread election fraud and therefore an illegitimate 2020 election. And on the latter, think about the current debates on the Democrat side over suspending the Senate filibuster and packing the Supreme Court. So these two conditions, which really are supposed to spell the oncoming death of democracy seem to be met in our uh, politics today. That's ideological polarization and why it matters. But just beneath the surface of this ideological polarization and in ways that you know I don't have the time here to fully elaborate, I think the engine that really drives this ideological polarization as a matter of historical fact is racial polarization. And here it's important to recognize two aspects of racial polarization. One is this kind of huge gap, this grand canyon of lived experiences, assumed privileges, imposed discrimination that separates the reality for most uh, whites in this country from most black indigenous people and people from communities of color in this country. That's racial polarization on the ground. Then there's a second kind of racial polarization, which is the result of what Ian Haney Lopez in Dog Whistle Politics refers to as a kind of strategic racism. That's the cynical mercenary deployment of dog, uh, racial dog whistles and racial bullhorns by politicians for the express purpose of getting votes, winning elections, securing political power. Uh, those two forms of polarization are, um, you know, by now all too familiar to us and I think have become part of our everyday vernacular in discussing, you know, threats to our democratic politics and what to do about it. But I think we also have to name and confront a third form of polarization, which is epistemic polarization. That's the extent to which Americans more and more um, every day inhabit different realities. So where some of us see injustice and racism in a black man being stopped and frisked for no other reason than his race and gender, other Americans are gonna see the reasonable pursuit of legitimate policing practices to keep our communities safe. And where some of us uh, accept the overwhelming science of climate change and a biosphere that seems to be under existential threat from it, Others see a threat to economic growth and our consumerist way of life and find reasons to doubt that science. Where some of us see structural racism, you know, a through line between how credit worthiness and risk are constructed in home mortgage loans in a way that gives some Americans access to wealth while excluding others, all the way through to, you know, the psychology of implicit bias and stereotype uh, type threat that shapes racial disparities in employment outcomes and educational attainment, all the way to social, legal, environmental determinants of health that lead to racial disparities in morbidity and mortality rates and so on. So some of us see that other people, you know, in this country see a reality that is constituted of individual isolated instances of poor judgment, misaligned incentives, deficient motivation, and so on. So that's that's epistemic polarization. And I think that's another way of describing uh, a phenomenon that has infected our politics, which a lot of people use the language of fake news uh, to describe. And 
you know, fake news, I think, has uh, two sources, one of which I call descriptive fake news, which is the extent to which our, inf our information environment today is increasingly polluted by claims about what happened uh, and what is true, which are manifestly not true, uh, which is manifestly not what happened. That's descriptive fake news. And then there's also evaluative fake news, which is the increasingly widespread belief among many Americans that you can't trust or believe in what institutions like the mass media, but also the scientific community, the medical community, universities and colleges, any profession that has expertise and any institution that adjudicates facticity that you can't trust or believe what they say. And let me give you just a sense of how important I think the growing phenomenon of epistemic polarization is to the ideals of democracy and belonging from my own research. So most Americans polls show agree that fake news uh, in the descriptive sense of our information environment being polluted by things that aren't true is a problem. Most Americans also are pretty confident that they can tell the difference between what mm -hmm. is real and what is fake. That's on the descriptive side. On the evaluative side, what I find is that disbelief in mass media sources as, as institutions that can be trusted or believed to tell us what is actually happening, that disbelief today is one of the strongest factors shaping how Americans think about politics. So if you disbelieve in, uh, if you disbelieve in the mass media, I can tell you how you're going to think about issues like raising the minimum wage, passing comprehensive immigration reform, repealing the Affordable Care Act, defunding the police, legalizing marijuana, and so on. I can also tell you, based on the fact that you disbelieve the mass media, what you think about the fundamental role of democratic institutions, like the role of a free press, whether or not you believe in a balance of powers between the executive and legislative branches, whether you think that there should be an independent judiciary. And this epistemic polarization is also deeply interlinked with ideological polarization and racial polarization and has its roots in these uh, other ways that we are divided. Uh, just as past generations of politicians have used racial dog whistles to further divide us, not just racially, but also politically, today's politicians, and I think from one side of the aisle, um, are exploiting you know, vague anxieties about change, vulnerability, precarity, and weaponizing them into the belief that you can't trust what the other side is telling you. Thank you. Um, uh, um, Thank you. Yeah. Did you want to finish? So I, I, well, I'll just say, you know, um, even that you can't trust what you're seeing with your own eyes. Um, the last thing that I'll say, and I'll, and I'll try to um, elaborate on this if I get a chance um, uh, later on, is there's a story that, um, that we can understand about how power operates. And each of these forms of polarization is layered into that story about how power operates from the visible face, the invisible face, and the face of power, which shapes really what you're even thinking about. And the real threat of epistemic power is its ability uh, to shape the way that we even think about the reality that is affecting us. And, and that's the real danger of epistemic polarization. And I'll stop. Thank, thank you. So Astra, um, the last five years have put uh, into sharp relief many vulnerabilities in the democratic norm. Um, but your writing emphasizes that we're uh, seeing effects of an anti-democratic institution and political culture that have actually long histories. It started well before the last five years. Um, can you talk about what is new in the present? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there there is change and there's continuity, and I think it's all really important that we um, that we take both of those things into account. And so, yes, in my book, Democracy May Not Exist, but Women's Women is Gone, and, and the companion film, What is Democracy? You know, I, I wanted to really examine that word and, um, and you know, the project I was filming in 2015, 2016, and kind of forced me to come to terms, I think, with how deeply undemocratic the American political system is. And, you know, I think it's important to note that when you're someone who wants to build a more inclusive 
uh, multiracial democracy, when that's your aspiration. And we need to put those anti-democratic elements front and center and to kind of acknowledge that we have a system that is really enforces a kind of minority rule. And people are talking about that much more these days. And I think that's a, a really important piece of progress. Um, kind of building a little bit on what was just said. I mean, I think we need to recognize these anti-democratic, it's, it's, there's structures, anti-democratic structures, and also sentiments. <laughs> and those, I guess, um, you know, in terms of structures, we're talking more about things like the Electoral College, the imbalance of, of apportionment in our Congress, right, because of gerrymandering, because of voter suppression, uh, also in the Senate, which gives each state two representatives, right, regardless of their population, and also, of course, of the Supreme Court, where a small number of people can veto legislation and suppress the will of the majority, the will of the people. Um, but there's been, I think, you know, an interesting... Um, people are still kind of afraid of majorities, afraid of democracy. We see that in the last year with the discussion of populism. And so I, I guess one thing I wanted to say here was that, you know, we see that among conservatives and liberals. Um, so we see this, right, where the Republican Party is now not only just anti the Democrats, but they're anti-democracy, right? They're actually saying, um, you know, right, that, that you know, the Electoral College is great because it, it actually it, uh, suppresses people, you know, the will of the majority. We're seeing all of these voter suppression laws in various states, et cetera. Um, and I think, but I think that there's a kind of subtle version of that on the liberal side where people are, yeah, to go back to my first point, not as invested in building mass organizations, kind of prefer to try to truck in the realm of elite opinion, um, and there's, you know, also worry about populism, worry about, you know, people's unruly passions and stuff like that. So one thing I took away from my, my work, uh, you know, my intellectual work, and it's part of my organizing work is that, you know, really, I think it's so important to defend a robust, majoritarian, you know, kind of populist conception of democracy. You cannot have democracy without the people. Um, so on that front, I think, uh, you know, I think, these things that we think associate with democracy, getting out the vote, proving access to the ballot, fighting these uh, suppressive measures are so important, but we also need to look to that bigger, that, that sort of more expansive democratic horizon. You know, one person, one vote's not enough. We barely had that in this country. We, you know, we as a, as a principle, we don't have it as a reality. We need one person, one equally meaningful vote, right? We need to, to set an even further sight than just fixing the system and the rules as we have them. Um, and I guess my last thought I'll say is to the question of polarization, I think polarization is really critical, but it's asymmetric. I don't think mm. that the Republicans polarizing and Republicans, uh, you mentioned sort of Republican vote suppression measures versus uh, the fil filibuster reform, right? Or potentially adding members to the Supreme Court. I don't see those as equal and, and opposite because one is trying to enable majorities mm. to actually <laughs> pass legislation, create popular, you know, to create laws that reflect policies that are popular, like a living wage, <laughs> like a functioning democracy, like, you know, protecting the environment. These are things, majorities of people for all of our differences, all of our divisions, all of our pain, right? That people, you know, majorities do want these things. And so I think when we put a conception of, you know, small d democracy, majoritarian, uh, putting majorities at the center of our conception of democracy, then we see how the polarization is not equal and opposite. And I think sometimes as a, this is the activist and the organizer, you need to polarize, you need to name your enemies, name the people who are strategically using racism, right? To divide and conquer people, to um, that are exploiting people, that are benefiting from these imbalances. So polarization is not always bad and it's certainly not equal and opposite in this moment. But thank you. Thank you and, and Dewana, if you could uh, uh, talk about the work that you're doing to expand voter participation and how you are pushing the civic engagement and voting space to see how um, material conditions, economic opportunities, and struggles need to be seen as uh, human impact prospects for democracy. Can you talk a bit about your work and what your thinking is and pushing in this holistic way? Yes, and, and I wanna be sure that I'm responsible uh, and thoughtful about the time. So I, I wrote my notes down here and part of that is because my brain is in a lot of different places given yesterday. And I think we're all sitting sort of in the context of watching um, multi layers of government happen and multi layers of organizing happen and multi layers of like how how do all of these systems actually collide and yesterday was a combination of all of that for me and i think that that is really um important um as we think about the work of um even um 
voter rights and and, and, and and bringing people into that space, I think part of the issue that we've seen and why we even started Woke Vote was because um, we wanted to have a conversation, a true conversation about the fact that in traditional organize or in traditional politics, even in traditional, if you look at just the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and independence, whatever, we have to start with the fact that most people in my community who look like me have such a distrust of those or um of those entities because they know that those entities have historically not considered them. And so even though there might be a progressive movement, progressive movements sometimes still show up with racial bias in our communities, still show up with you know different biases in, in marginalized communities. So it's very hard to trust something to rectify itself, right? So Audre Lorde said something like, um, the master's tool cannot dismantle the master's house, right? So most people are thinking that, okay, if the only options that I have is to align myself with this party or this party, but the entire system is still based within or rooted within a space that says that I don't exist or that I don't care or that I am um, not interested in politics or you know I I'm, I'm I've devalued the I, the idea of democracy, then how does that show up then in my community and tell me who to vote for or why I should get activated? And so what we've had to do um, is really decentralize candidates and parties from our ag our organizing work and and recenter um community right and recenter what it means to actually have a political voice why is your vote currency why you know how do you leverage power it's revisiting this idea of power mapping right if you look at um uh, organizations and from the from the civil rights movement and from the women's movement and from uh, every single movement, one of the conversations was around power because all of this is really a conversation around who wells it, who has it, and who doesn't have it, right? And how do you utilize it once you realize what power means? Well, power means something different in every community, in every niche area that we're operating in. So for us, what we've been able to do is say, listen. Until someone, if you are of the mindset that all of this stuff needs to be burned down to the ground and start over, the reality is it still takes some time to burn something, right? If you're of the mindset of we're, we need to work on what we have and reform it, it still takes a moment to reform. So in every level, what is the opportunity for us to advance something that saves ourselves, something that helps us to have a voice, to have power? In that space and so what we've been doing is saying and going into spaces that number one um if you look at traditional sort of methodology around organizing and turning out the vote they will tell you that the that most money most resources are invested in what they call um high opportunity voters or voters who have a voter um, index score of about maybe normally it's about 60 or more or 40 percent or more depending on where you are and they say the traditional models say that you should invest all of your money or at least all of your resources and the majority of your strategy should go towards these voters who you know will come will turn out well in place in communities like mine in marginalized communities because we've already been under invested in our power our politics have already been under invested in um when you say well i'm not going to invest in even communicating with this person about the political process you are actually leaving out huge sectors of community, huge sectors of state, uh, of, of, of cities, huge sectors of counties. And so we actually start our process at, at organizing whether someone has a zero propensity score or a 50 propensity score. Yeah. So we work within that niche of zero to 30 that most people have said don't even matter to engage. And what we're finding is that we're able to actually impact the turnout and impact the, the uh, outcome in every single election that we've worked in because we're working with a group of people who most people have not factored into their strategy, right? So if we're able to turn out, if you look at a, um, even let's look at the, you know, the race um, uh, in last year uh, in Georgia, the, the, the runoff race, right? We were on the ground uh, in Georgia in several different cities where um, quite frankly, everybody wanted to be in Atlanta or in Fulton County, the places where they believe that turnout is going to actually shift uh, or, or it's really where, that's where everybody's going to vote. But we were in the, the makings of the world, the savannas of the world, where there are a uh, an extreme amount of um, uh, voters of color, uh, uh, of high level, a percentage of voters of color um, who have not been engaged, who had not been given resources, who um, 
quite frankly, didn't even have um, a voting booth that was for some people within 20 minutes of their home, right? And so having to engage them, number one, on why they should do, why they should turn back, uh, you know, uh, get out and vote for a candidate that they may not even necessarily under, you know, align with, that's the real work. And you cannot do that work in an election cycle. So our strategy is that the organizing actually happens before the election, right? It happens before it's time to make a decision about who the candidate is or who they aren't. And so if you're not, if you're not in, um, investing in our ability to organize effectively every year, year round, whether it is an election cycle or not, then you're not interested in actually building our political power. You're only interested in our votes. And so our vote is no longer levied behind who's investing during an election cycle. We're, we're you know, and, and to some extent, we're also saying that, you know, what we found is that if you're not willing to invest in our learning about how we think about politics or our learning about how to organize, then you're also not interested in investing in our political power or investing in us to be a part of your system. Um, because the learning is actually more important. The organizing of how we think about things, why we think about things, that's what gets people into a participatory democracy. And so if you don't want to invest in that, you know, we're saying fine, you don't have to, but then don't act like we're going to show up in mass for your for your thing or for your candidate or for your we don't owe you a vote because you're a Democrat. We don't owe you a vote yeah. because you're not, right? And so um, we've, and you're starting to see that. But the, the 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 last thing I will say is that we are really a lot of this is changing the narrative around um, some of the language that is used, right? So when you even say something like um, someone is disengaged uh, or someone um, is uh, disillusioned with the political system. No, they're not disillusioned. They absolutely understand what is happening. They are they are just not willing to play within a system that they feel like does not seat them. So we have to start making room for those conversations um, and realizing that political data typically is inherently racist. It's typically inherently um, sexist. It's typically inherently um, biased around uh, wealth and, and, and access to, to education. And so when you have data uh, data analysts and um, organizations that are, that are handling data that are do not necessarily see the communities that they are uh, researching a certain kind of way, that is reflected in the data. So when someone says, well, we're only going to invest in these particular political communities because the data tells us so, and then I ask you, well, how many people, you know, that's managing your data reflect the community that they're actually getting ready to to research and you tell me zero, I've got a problem with that. Um, or at least a strategy that, that is not rooted, uh, uh, an engagement strategy that is not rooted in making sure that you have some sort of cultural context or some sort of academic context about the communities that you're, that you're, that you're organizing in. So our program looks to, um, like I said, looks to make the individuals on the ground enlighten their experience as leaders to run campaigns, to run candidates, to um, create spaces that allow for a more um, authentic um, and, if you will, a more genuine um, uh, place where people can act actually activate around voting. And that's what Thank we've been doing. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. We've had like a really rich conversation where lots of folks have surfaced a bunch of great ideas, actually gone in depth in a few. Um, this is where we're starting to try and put all the pieces together. Uh, I'm asking all of the panelists to be very mindful of time. Look at the cal look at the clock on your computer. Um, we want um, no more than 90 seconds response to the last question that I'm going to pose. And that question is where do we go from here? And I know that's very hard because all of you could go uh, at length about this, but we want a 90 second response from each of you. Where do we go from here? And I'm going to start with you, Astra. Oh my gosh. I mean, I, I really uh, so appreciate what Dejana just said about um, you about speaking to people's you know, cynicism, that, that's how I describe it, right? It's like, and acknowledging it and starting there because it's so legitimate, right? Because people, um, it's actually a rational reflection of the system and the degree of, you know, how left out the majority of people are. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you do that, then you can start to say, cause then you can actually acknowledge that things need to radically change. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. instead of, I'm always cringing the phrase like our democracy, 
And it's like, well, who's democracy? And this doesn't, this, you know, this is not, we deserve so much more than this. So I really like that, you know, actually starting the conversations in honesty and integrity. And then you're also, you're able to sort of be pragmatic. Okay, how do we make our lives better and, and win some reforms with that transformative horizon? Um, and so I think that's it. I mean, I think what people need to do to go from here, people often ask in my talks, you know, what can I do? And I always say, well, it's not about what individuals can do. It's a we process. And so join a group. Whether that is, you know, a union, a debtors union, a tenants organization, a group fighting for immigrants' rights. I mean, join something. And I think because it's through that um, collectivity and collabor uh, collaboration that actually we get where we need to go. We know there's a list of policies we'd like to see and reforms we'd like to see. We don't get them unless we work together and we build that power. Okay, perfect. What about you, Dewana? You know, I think. Um, <laughs> That's where do we go from here? I think that there is a real um, need for us uh, to learn, right? Uh, what I love about what um, Take You, I hope I'm saying your name right, was saying. Mm -hmm. There's just so much. There's so much there to to um, to grapple with. That if we don't do the research and take the time to actually break down the concepts, then we're gonna miss opportunities to actually collaborate and to actually be in meaningful conversation with each other as we think about new strategies. And so I think that creating spaces where people can actually take the time to learn about what these things are and, and dismantle the ideas or, you know, piece together something, you know, some dismantle the idea, if you will, but piece together the, the solution. That's really what we're hoping for. And that requires a radical investment in people and communities and leaders that don't look like the traditional model. And I think that's really the, the, the where we go from here is demanding that people invest in local leaders, invest in local organizations, invest in local groups, invest in independent projects, invest, invest in local art, all of the things that are needed and required for us to come to consensus around these larger ideals that we are grappling with. There has to be investment in the process of doing that work. Perfect. And what about you, KK? Well, just really quickly, I think part of figuring out where we go from here is to remember how we got here. And you know, part of that story, as as Oscar pointed out, is to recognize that we're polarized, but but the polarization is asymmetric. I mean, part of our mm -hmm. polarization is based in the fact that you know, the Republican Party has been, you know, succumbed to a hostile takeover from, you know, an extremist faction so that, you know, what used to be these radicals within the Republican Party, you know, is now the establishment of the Republican Party. The other part of uh, you know, understanding how we got here, again, is to appreciate how important a robust civil society is as a counterweight to what is happening in the private sector and what is happening in government. I mean, there is a through line that connects Occupy Wall Street to the movement for LGBTQ equality, Me Too, March for Our Lives, Dreamers, Black Lives Matter. And that's all a resurgence of, you know, a mobilized, activated, you know, civil society. I mean, estimates are somewhere between 25 and 30 million Americans. That's Black, Latinx, Asian American, Pacific Islander, Native American, and white, you know, marched in the streets for Black lives. And, you know, that's what transformative change looks like. So, you know, we have to reinvest in civil society. That's just not just organizations, mm -hmm. that's not just members, but that's also, you know, for somebody like me, you know, um, researching what really works in terms of organizing and what doesn't work in terms of organizing and really building kind of a thriving ecology of uh, organizations, you know, uh, in civil society from your PTA, your local school board, to faith-based organizations, nonprofits, advocacy organizations, all the way to labor unions uh, and places that you know I, I inhabit in colleges and, and universities, because that's where the innovation and transformation is happening. And the last thing I'll say, which you know I say whenever I can get a chance to say, is that we have to remember that you know democracy is not a noun; it's a verb. It's 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 achieved by doing things. And so that's where we need to make our investments when, you know, uh, when government is failing us, when the party system is failing us, when people distrust the mass media and when corporate America is not stepping up to do their part to maintain, you know, uh, a flourishing democracy. Uh, that was all very rich. Thank you guys so much for minding the time. Um, we are going to uh, continue the conversation with another short answer. And that question is, is 
what are the new conversations that are being happening about democracy? Are you hearing new definitions of uh, democracy? And I am going to start with you, Dewana. I knew you were going to start with me. Um, <laughs> I'm meditating so that everybody can start with us once. I'm very into equality. Right. Okay. I love it. Um, the new conversations that are happening, I think, I'm not sure that I can say that there are new conversations, whether they're more so that there's um, new ideas about what's possible and people are starting to lean into um, being un being comfortable with the fact that it may be something different than what they see right now. Right. Um, I think that that's kind of what you saw in the in the streets last year was that people were like, no, I'm actually OK with having to do something different and having to fight for something different. So those conversations are helping people to um, imagine, you know, what does if we say we want a different um, or a, 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 a more beloved community, what is that? You know, um, but the la the other thing that I think has that I've been hearing a lot about is really this alignment um, um, uh, uh, with looking what's happening across the globe, right? Not necessarily just what's happening here, and and really studying it and drawing um, parallels between what's happening in South Africa, what's happening in you know different parts of the of the world that help me to illuminate what's possible for us to do and move. Um, what's happening in Green uh, in Greenland, and how are they able to do this? And you know all of these different things. So there's the conversations around changing the systems and broadening what is possible are the things that I think are are that I'm hearing the most about right now. That's really interesting. So I'm going to say uh, goodbye. I'm very sorry. I have a meeting with the court. And when they tell you to show up at a certain time, you don't say no. Um, but uh, who's going to start off with the moderating? Um, but take this is actually your chance to answer the question again. What is new in this conversation? Um, and how does that change our definitions of democracy? Thank you guys so much. And I uh, look forward to watching the video of the rest of the panel later. Good luck. Good luck and thank, thank you, you so much, Myrna, for, for moderating our, our panel so far. So, uh, you know, um, what's new? I'll, I'll say a few things that I'm seeing and I'll try to stick here to, you know, sort of like, you know, being the academic on the, on the panel, mm -hmm. just in terms of the data. I think that there is kind of this transformation that is happening out of civil society. And I'm seeing data points that are consistent with that in the following kind of senses. I think more so than in any previous elections. And, and I take, you know, Duana, I take your um, uh, your insights about the limits of focusing too much on, on elections and imputing something about what's happening in terms of social change from what's happening in elections. But I'll say more so than any previous elections that I've kind of uh, seen and analyzed, um, I'm finding that more people are getting into politics, electoral politics, Absolutely. through their involvement in social movement activism. So Absolutely. I think that's a new thing in the current generation that we haven't seen mm -hmm. before. More so than other previous elections, you know, it's not just about record numbers of people getting mobilized in 2018 and 2020, it's the way they're getting mobilized. So mm -hmm. it's less so because somebody from the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or one of their candidates reaches out to you, but I'm seeing more and more the role of nonpartisan organizations getting Absolutely. involved. I mean, that's how that's how Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff win Absolutely. in Georgia in 2020. Mm -hmm. I'm also seeing um, what I think of as kind of lateral mobilization. So more so mm -hmm. than in previous elections, people say, yeah, I actually tried to get my friend, I tried to get somebody in my family mm -hmm. to get politically active, to get registered to vote, to turn out to vote. In 2020, that number is 70% of Americans in these polls say, yeah, I actually tried to get my family member or you know a friend, a close friend to get uh, registered, to get active in politics. So I think that's how, I mean, it's really easy, I think, and tempting to just live in this sober reality of our time that Americans are polarized, that we live in echo chambers and filter bubbles and then kind of do nothing about it. But I think at the same time, there's a lot of, uh, data points that I'm seeing that suggest that people aren't going to take that as their, you know, as their status quo, and they're actually actively working in their communities and maybe across political aisles to try to change that reality. Um, mm -hmm. Astrid, do you want to um, uh, share with us what you see as as new in the conversation? Yeah, new in the conversation about democracy. Again, new, you know, things are often old and new at the same time. So mm -hmm. I just did an, I've written a lot about and just an event where some people are pushing to recognize the rights of nature, right? Using um, 
uh, you know, using local ordinances to essentially say this um, this ecosystem, right? This river, this lake. I think Lake Toledo is one of them, um, or Lake Erie. Sorry, Toledo hat you know has rights and has to be accounted for in some way. So how do we expand democracy to include or represent the non-human world? I see that as something that's very interesting and is drawing on um, older indigenous traditions. So that's something that's happening across the country and is actually it's quite. I followed up on an effort in Pennsylvania that I'd written about about five or six years ago, and they were making progress. They had managed to ward off um, uh, an injection well, so that where you you dump toxic waste from fracking by using this, by using this, um, I don't want to call it a mechanism, but this expansion of who's accounted for. I think you're exactly right. So in a, in a different register, that there's something really promising right now about the way people and young activists and organizers think about yet and outside strategy. Even at Occupy Wall Street, which is, you know, was a very formative thing for me, we wouldn't make demands of the state, right? We were outside of the electoral realm, outside of politics. I think much more savvy, much more strategic about how you have to build political power and people power and how those things actually are, you know, both necessary and you have to have to exist in that that tension. And now you see ideas getting to the mainstream in a much more powerful um, way. And that, you know, I think you can see that, for example, in the movement I've been part of around debt cancellation. <laughs> we first raised this demand for student debt cancellation for a student debt jubilee in the early days of Occupy Wall Street. And people told us we were ridiculous. And there were many articles written that said, that sounds nice, it will never happen. But we built a base, we figured out how to engage with the power structure. Uh, you know, we were, uh, we used different creative legal mechanisms and pushed that into the political realm. Right to say no. This, this we want to move from the margin to the mainstream to the center. And now you have, um, you have this as a serious, you know, possibility. This year we might see some major um, debt cancellation, which would be a completely novel thing. <laughs> would be you know there it would be um, something that seemed impossible, seemed very utopian, actually becoming a reality. So that's um, uh, and the last thing I'll say is just the revival of socialism. Um, seeing you know, that's not something even ten years ago I would have thought that there would be people in Congress, I mean, there's Bernie Sanders alone in the Senate, but that that's something that is a, a, vi a, a vibrant movement, but also that what, what's really interesting is how pe people involved in are thinking, well, what do we want of the state? We want to democratize the state. And so you see in the new Green New Deal proposals today, uh, mixing the state with decentralization, with small d democracy. And so not just, you know, and so really also looking what socialism is for the 21st century and how to make it inclusive. And, um, and to uh, think about democratizing the economy and the state. So I think these are all really interesting, you know, trends that that give me some optimism and help me maintain, as Miriam Kava says, hope is a discipline, right? <laughs> hope yeah. isn't just something you have, it's something you also have to cultivate. We have just a few more minutes left, and and I think um, uh, we're kind of off script now. So let me just invite each of you to share, you know, one last thing that you'd like to leave with the audience in terms of, um, you know, um, ideas for what we need to think about, what we need to work towards to try to, you know, uh, build towards a, a fuller realization of our our democracy. Um, Luana, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, well, I want to first say that I, um, I'm i so glad that I had this, what I really feel like is sacred space today um, mm -hmm. to have this conversation and to think through, you know, strategically next steps, you know, just given um, yesterday's events. Um, I, I appreciate the work that each of you are doing uh, and, and hope that we can connect in meaningful ways even after this after this conversation. Um, and I'm appreciative of all the people who are, you know, sharing with us in this conference. And it reminds me that this work, um, you know, even though it sometimes feels very heavy um, and it feels like you can be in a silo and, and, and a lot is on our shoulders, that really there are so many people who are carrying the burden together. And so I think that um, the, the thing that I would remind us is that um, to be gentle uh, with ourselves and with um, each other as we navigate these spaces, um, to allow space for people to to learn. I think the reason why that's such a big um, thing for me is because you know sometimes these these places that we're in, these spaces that we're in, they move so fast 
that people can't even, you know, conceptualize sometimes what they need mm -hmm. because they're literally trying to deal with what's upon them at that moment, right? The election is today. This is, you know, somebody got shot today. This, you know, it's so rapid, you know, that it doesn't always allow for someone to sit with how, how can it be something different? How could it be better? What is my place in that? What is my role in that? How do we, you know, how do we invite people in and call people out? And so I'm always for, um, trying to create systems and structures and spaces and programs and conferences that allow people to, to for a moment to sit with the work and sit with um, what we're trying to do so that we can have more informed, more um, definitive, if you will, more rooted, if you will, um, responses to that work. And the last thing I will say is that um, I am very, 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 uh, thoughtful about the fact that I feel like um, our, all of the structures that we made that we could agree on or not agree on are under attack in some form or fashion. Like, and I think that when people feel like they're under attack, they, the pose is that, you know, the response is an under attack um, response. What would you do if you felt like somebody was, you know, coming, mm -hmm. you know, to attack you, you're going to defend yourself. And I think that we have to have and arm people with the best ways to defend themselves um, in this moment. And I think a lot of that is through strategy. It is through opening under, you know, having these conversations and also being willing to listen and, and not try to explain away why a person feels a certain kind of way, but actually figure out what's rooting that thing and give them some, some solutions or help them to find those solutions. And so that, that's what I encourage us to do today is to make the room and make the space um, that will allow for the changes that we want to see. That's wonderful. Great. Thank you so much, Astrid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all that. I don't have that that much to add in this. I mean, I'm I'm thinking about John's opening keynote and what we and what the mm -hmm. the ideas informing this conference, mm -hmm. and it, you know, and thinking about the idea of expanding the we and bridging. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a piece called "The Right to Listen." And so one thing I've been thinking mm -hmm. about, and it's something that is, I think underappreciated part of democracy and organizing is not the role of speech and deliberation and debate, but listening. Mm -hmm. um, and that we don't even have, we don't even have a political framework for that. But, you know, people who are lifelong organizers will say, you know, a good organizer begins by listening. So what's going on in your community? Mm -hmm. Where are you at? Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's how we learn. It's how we hear other people's stories. So I feel like that's something you know, it's something to me, and I, it's also my work as a, a filmmaker and interviewing people is that listening yeah. is the underappreciated democratic <laughs> art, mm -hmm. and that we should, um, especially if we want to do this work of, um, and I agree, you know, I including people critically, right? Sometimes you have to call you you have to call people out too, but that listening needs to be part of our our political practice. I'm I'm so appreciative of 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 both of your final thoughts. I'll try to just add uh, a couple of final thoughts of, of my own. And the first is that uh, everything you say about um, uh, listening being so key to organizing is true of this panel as well. I've really appreciated the opportunity to, to learn and listen to, to the wisdom of, 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 of your words, both of you. Um, I, I, um, I was thinking of, um, you know, many of us probably got, uh, interview requests about what we thought about the jury verdict yesterday. And, you know, my first response to the first call I got was that it felt a little bit like, you know, uh, a patient um, who has, uh, you know, third or fourth stage liver cirrhosis being, uh, you know, finally getting to the point of saying, I think I may have uh, a drinking problem. I mean, I think you know, um, we we are broken in so many ways that I think it was really important. It's a, it's an it's an important first step to say I think I may have a drinking problem, and then there's a lot of really hard work that has to follow in terms of understanding you know what is diseased about American democracy and how we can uh, how we can begin uh, the process of healing it. And the last uh, thought uh, that I I feel like I need to say is to try to. Um, recover uh, a lost moment in what um, Congresswoman Maxine Waters said about being more confrontational. I feel mm -hmm. like, at least in the mainstream media, it was uh, widely kind of excoriated as the thing you don't do the day before mm -hmm. the jury or the couple of days before a jury is about to reach its verdict. And, you know, uh, at least in the media that I saw, everybody celebrate the judge for 
essentially reprimanding the congresswoman. And I want to I want to I want to take the moment to say that getting more confrontational is definitely an option. I think that is um, the embodiment of what good trouble means in this moment. If the jury had not um, gotten to the verdict that so clearly was consistent with the reality that all of us saw. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to, to surface that. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, um, being patient with us in this panel, for hopefully um, uh, getting some pearls of wisdom from this panel. I feel really honored to have been part of this panel. And um, mm -hmm. I also do want to hope that we can uh, stay in touch after this panel. And this has been a wonderful conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you for stepping in as moderator as well. Yes, really appreciate <laughs> Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks.